This episode is all about video game compilations. But you know, a box from Factor is also a compilation of sorts. A curated collection of ready to heat, never frozen meals for the week. Like I said the last time we had a Factor sponsorship, I'm legit a loyal customer myself. It just works great for me and my way of doing. And we've got an even more generous offer for you this time. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code MLIG50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and free wellness shots for life. Two free wellness shots from the three available flavors for every order while you're an active subscriber. Oh, that's two of these lemony tasting things for free for every week for life alongside your chef prepared meals with code MLIG50, which again is also 50% off that first box. So check that link and use that code at factor75.com today. You know, these days, I think there's a tendency to hastily jump on the conclusion that games are too expensive. But here, check out this order slip from my copy of Chrono Trigger, where you could purchase Final Fantasy III directly from Squaresoft. And would you look at that price? In 1995, Final Fantasy III would be part of a two-game collection released on the PlayStation 1 just four years later for nearly half that price. Whether it's something as simple as two games being compiled onto one cartridge, a disc packed full of emulated classics that may or may not exhibit a variety of issues, or even full game series being repackaged into one impressive box set, I bet most of us own at least one multi-game compilation in some form or another. So why not show off a bunch of these collections that stuffed an assortment of games that were at one point sold individually into one single release to not only bring them to a whole new audience, but also <laughs> offer one heck of a value. Trust me, there are way more than you think. With the full breadth of gaming history stretching back many decades at this point, it's no surprise that games both very old and games much less old continue to be bundled together and resold. From basic box sets with multiple discs, updated remasters, and even as interactive documentaries like what Digital Eclipse has been doing with Atari 50 and their Gold Master series. Needless to say, we won't be hitting everything in this episode, not even close. So we're just gonna have some fun hitting as broad a range of compilation type packages as we can reasonably get to in one video. Since we are physical media fans, that's definitely a focus here, but of course many of these are available digitally as well, or could be interesting to check out through emulation or with fan patches. The practice of bundling games together goes back quite far. I mean, the first video game that I ever owned was a combo cart. The ubiquitous Super Mario Bros. Duck Hunt that was the NES's most famous packing cartridge. Back in the day, I never knew anyone who even owned the separate carts versions of these. There's also the weird triple game variant with world-class track meet. Whenever I look at this cart, I can't help but wonder what's on the duck's mind. and if he's really doing okay. A similar practice of cramming pre-existing games for a system into one ROM was employed by Konami with the Konami GB Collection series, which was not released in North America. Four volumes with four Game Boy games each were released in 1997 and 1998 in Japan, and then in 2000 with Game Boy Color support only in Europe. Each collection has its heavy hitter highlights and filler titles, but I was most interested in Volume 1 for its color version of the outstanding Game Boy Contra game known as Operation C, or rather Probotector as it's called in Europe. But guess what? This really blew my mind when I tried the copy I bought on my recent trip to Germany. You don't play as the Euro-friendly Probotector robot. The character sprite is the same Bill Riser from the 1991 Japanese and North American releases. 
They even show more detailed artwork of him in the collection introduction looking clearly human. I don't know exactly what Germany was like with its handling of violence in games at the time, but the fact that this made it to Europe in this form both surprises and delights me. Also included in Volume 1 is a colorized nemesis renamed Gradius here, or Gradius, whatever, and Castlevania the Adventure, which you shouldn't expect to run any more smoothly on Game Boy Color, unfortunately, but honestly, the game isn't that bad once you settle in with it. These are not the most impressive color conversions on the whole, and I may even prefer the original monochrome presentation in some ways, but some are better than others, and it's just neat that they exist. The European Volume 3 has another shocker with the inclusion of a full English translation of a 1991 Goemon game that was otherwise never released outside Japan. Unfortunately, Europe's Volume 4 is quite pricey, and I wish that weren't so, because I'd love to have a color version of Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge. Just be warned that while Volume 1 contains the same games between Japan and Europe, the numbering on Volumes 2, 3, and 4 are jumbled up between the two regions, so do some careful research before you buy. Speaking of collections on Game Boy that have screwed up numbering between regions, Europe and Australia got a strange sort of proto Game & Watch Gallery game in 1995 called Game Boy Gallery. This is a compilation of five Game & Watch titles remade with music and updated visuals featuring generic cartoon characters. The timing of the visual cues and gameplay remains similar to the original standalone games. The biggest update is probably Manhole, where the smooth movement of the pedestrians makes it easier to judge who's at risk of falling next. So where that makes things a bit messy is that for the series we know as Game & Watch Gallery in North America, well, assuming I've got the facts straight in my head here, Europe started calling it Game & Watch Gallery as well, but Japan used the European and Australian moniker of Game Boy Gallery from the earlier game, and Australia maintained that as the series name as well, resulting in the 1997 game being called Game & Watch Gallery in North America and Europe, Game Boy Gallery in Japan, and Game Boy Gallery 2 in Australia. Australia would continue to number these games one ahead of other regions, and it's a big confusing mess. At any rate, these of course replace the generic characters from the 1995 game with Mario characters in the so-called modern modes, and translate the original Game & Watch art and gameplay more faithfully with the classic modes. I'm glad that the classic modes exist for historical context, but if you ask me, the modern modes are where it's at and are what made me fall in love with this series. While your character generally snaps to preset locations just as in the original games, the things that you catch or interact with tend to move much more smoothly, and other minor gameplay tweaks and animation flourishes just make the action feel that much more satisfying. These are among the few high score type games that I've ever felt truly captivated by, and they're just great for a quick play anytime. My top favorites across the series on Game Boy and Game Boy Advance would have to be Chef, Manhole, Fire, and Parachute. The more platformery ones like Donkey Kong Jr. might look appealing at a glance, but I feel they stray too far from the purity of design that makes the other games on these collections so good. These are peak portable gaming fun, and I recommend having them ready to play on whatever handheld gaming device you prefer. If you remember the good old Club Nintendo days when Japan got all the coolest physical items and North America got crap, well, some of the most enticing loyalty rewards that were actually available worldwide were Game & Watch Collection and Game & Watch Collection 2. I missed getting these through Club Nintendo back in the day, so I imported the Japanese versions later. Admittedly, they're mostly just collection novelties for me, because these feature the Game & Watch classic style presentation only, which I don't enjoy all that much, but I do appreciate them as a way of preserving the original experience, especially because the DS is a perfect platform for replicating the dual screen format Game & Watch titles.
You know, when we first started gathering material for this episode, I found myself spiraling just thinking about who might be the king of the hill when it comes to repackaging their old games. Sega, Namco, Konami, or Capcom? My gut instinct says Sega. I mean, we all want to say Sega, right? Well, for my segments in this episode, I'm going to be looking at some of the best and most interesting collections from all four of them, starting with Sega. Now, I've talked a whole lot about certain compilations of theirs in different videos over the years. So, in an effort to try to keep things fresh here, I'm going to stay away from many of those during this go-around. As Tri mentioned, most people's first game compilation was probably the Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt cartridge that was included with their NES. I, naturally, had a Sega Master System, and the equivalent on there was the Hang On and Safari Hunt combo cartridge that was a pack-in with my system. I really liked that Sega was focused on the experiences that they were most well known for, being their arcade games. Systems that didn't include the light phaser had a different combo that swapped out Safari Hunt for the vertically scrolling shooter Astro Warrior. Although multi-game pack-ins went on a bit of a hiatus, they came back in a big way with CD-ROM based add-ons. The US launch of the Sega CD included a whole slew of games in the box to help take the edge off the intimidating $300 price tag. Soul Feast and Sherlock Holmes helped show off some of the system's graphical and sound capabilities. But the Sega Classics Arcade Collection, which had Golden Axe, Streets of Rage, Columns, and The Revenge of Shinobi on one disc, showed off the storage possibilities. Now, sure, these are pretty iconic Genesis games, and I bet a lot of people who own the systems owned at least one or two of these already. But four full games on one disc seemed impressive at the time, even though it was only about 11.8 megabytes on the disc. When the Sega CD Model 2 hit, Super Monaco GP was added to the Arcade Classics disc pack-in. There were subtle changes made to each game's audio, mostly in the voice quality department. And I'm not sure if I'd say if any of it was an improvement. It's not like these games had bad voice samples in the first place. And these cleaned up and redone versions lose a lot of that crunchy intensity that the cars had. Depending on your feelings about that, the only real downside to this collection is a big one. The two-player mode was removed from Golden Axe. I have no idea what the deal is with that, but it's a heck of a downside. On a trip to Japan in 2018, one of the things on my mental checklist of things that I'd like to try and buy was the duo of Sega Games Can volumes for the Mega CD. These discs compiled all of the Sega Game to Shoken Mega Modem downloadable mini games onto a couple of discs with novel yet uniquely annoying packaging. Originally, the main draw for me was to have the Fantasy Star 2 text adventures, but I've come to realize that the real gold here is in the other micro games, because they're pretty much all fun, with the language barrier only being an issue on a few select games. Hi, Some of these will be recognizable to arcade and Master System fans, like Pengo and Teddy Boy Blues, while others, like Flicky and Fatal Labyrinth, were good enough to get standalone cart releases in other parts of the world. In those cases, the major difference is that the Game Can's versions have Redbook CD audio. At the end of the Genesis's heyday, Majesco took over the manufacturing of the console, games, and peripherals in North America, while Sega moved over to focusing on the Saturn. The Sega 6-pack included the most often repackaged games on the system on one cart. Columns, Golden Axe, Sonic the Hedgehog, Streets of Rage, Super Hang-On, and The Revenge of Shinobi. While these days, it might not seem like it's all that special, but every single one of these would rank pretty high in a list of the best games on the system. There was a Sonic Classics Genesis cart released in 1997 that had Sonic 1, 2, and Mean Bean Machine on it. But considering the rabbit hole that is Sonic compilations and re-releases, that is a project for a future video. I wonder if Sonic 1 is the most re-released game of all time. 
It's got to be in the conversation, right? I can't help but bring up the Dreamcast Sega Smash Pack Volume 1 because, you know, I can't resist dunking on every chance I can. It kills me every single time. And you know what? For my money, it might be the funniest thing in video games. But you know what? There is some merit to this collection because of the inclusion of a port of the PC version of Virtual Cop 2. You might forget it was even there, but this was probably the best home version of the game until Virtual Cop Rebirth on the PlayStation 2 in 2002. That version was a compilation of VC1 and 2, complete with enhanced graphics, options, and GunCon 2 support. Unfortunately, it was only released in Japan and Europe, but if you have a way to play Japanese PS2 games, there is an English language option. You know, as often as we've been pummeled with Sega Genesis and Mega Drive re-releases over the years, it is super easy to forget about the other compilations of Sega's games that have come and gone, many times with much less fanfare than they probably deserve. After the death of the Dreamcast and Sega pulling out of the hardware market, Microsoft saw fit to include the Sega GT 2002 and Jet Set Radio Future Double Pack with Xbox systems sold in 2002. I'm not sure if these two games helped them sell more systems beyond the Sega fans still smarting from the Dreamcast's abandonment, but I certainly appreciate Microsoft trying to build that bridge. Although it's oddly never mentioned on the packaging outside of the two discs label on the back, Space Channel 5 Special Edition on the PlayStation 2 contains both the original Space Channel 5 and Space Channel 5 Part 2. This collection marked the first time that Part 2 was officially released in the U.S. Whether you like it or not, Death Battle! Get down! This game has style to spare, but wow, is it hard. I'm bad at rhythm games with button prompts, but here, both games requires you to remember the input combinations as well as listening for it in the rhythm of the song while you perform it with a very small input window. I'm not even sure if it's possible, even with lower lag modern upscaling tech. A CRT might be a necessity here. What's wrong, Oolala? Ever since I first played LA Machine Guns with its comically huge light guns at Kahunaville in the Walden Galleria in Buffalo, New York, I've dreamed of having it at home, even though I knew it would never compare. Arcade Hits Pack, Gunblade New York, and LA Machine Guns, Rage of the Machines on the Nintendo Wii, unleashed in 2010 to the unsuspecting public with almost zero fanfare. But I knew that I had to have it. And I'd also finally be able to play its Model 2 prequel, Gunblade New York. These are right at home on the Wii using pointer controls, but the Wii Remote, or even the Wii Zapper, are poor substitutes for that ridiculously oversized machine gun. Vegas is under control. Another two-pack of light gun games on the Wii from Sega is House of the Dead 2 and 3 Returns, which collects the Dreamcast port of House of the Dead 2 and the Xbox version of House of the Dead 3. Each game has a few different modes and some unlockables, but I really wish the fourth game was included here. But I don't know, maybe it was just too new at the time and would have required a bunch of extra work. A handgun attachment like the Nyko Perfect Shot are a necessity here. Had enough yet? The Dreamcast collection for the Xbox 360 has four of Sega's HD Dreamcast ports on a single disc. Sega Bass Fishing, Sonic Adventure without the Battle DLC, Space Channel 5 Part 2, which seems to have a much more forgiving input window than the Special Edition, and Crazy Taxi without the Offspring or Bad Religion, or even Pizza Hut, Tower Records, KFC, and the rest. Pop this disc into the Xbox One or Series X and it will automatically download the games that are backwards compatible. Now that I think about it, this actually might be the only way to own these HD versions on disc. Oh, a big one! Lastly, I'd just like to mention the Japanese exclusive HD versions of Like a Dragon 1 and 2 for the PS3 and Wii U. 
Hopefully one day, these will get hacked versions with the English translation grafted onto them. Not the dub, but just the translation. If you're someone like myself who has only gotten into the series over the last few years, it's really interesting to go back to the PS2 versions and see what the early days of the series was like. These HD ports improved not only the resolution, but the frame rate and loading speeds in and out of battle too. It would be really great to have these with an English translation. So Konami and Nintendo both had some issues with mismatched numbering in the compilations they released in different regions worldwide, but another Japanese company instead used compilations to course correct their prior regional mismatching of numbered entries. With Final Fantasy Anthology on the PlayStation, Squaresoft brought Final Fantasy V to the West for the first time, as well as fixed the numbering on Final Fantasy VI formerly known in North America as Final Fantasy III. Sorry, Corey. Final Fantasy Chronicles later marked the first time that the fourth Final Fantasy was called Final Fantasy IV in North America rather than Final Fantasy II. Sorry, Corey. I think the inclusion of Chrono Trigger in the FF Chronicles package is fine because I've always thought of it as a sort of honorary Final Fantasy game, but this version has some pretty infamous issues with loading. However, I have a lot that I want to say about these games, their various versions, and these releases in particular, so I've decided to save further ramblings for another time. Much like E's Book 1 and 2, the first two Final Fantasy games have long been paired and sold together, beginning with an oversized Famicom cartridge that includes both games in one. But the first time Final Fantasy II made it outside Japan, the actual Final Fantasy II, sorry Corey, was with Final Fantasy Origins on PlayStation, which includes visually and orally revamped versions of Final Fantasy I and II with some nice gameplay tweaks. The visuals here originated with the Wonderswan color versions, and I've always really liked the presentation. This is my favorite version of Final Fantasy 1, and remains the only version of Final Fantasy 2 that I've finished. FF1 and 2 were also crammed onto a single GBA ROM called Dawn of Souls. Visually, this one is very similar to the Final Fantasy Origins versions, and it's fine as I recall, although it's weird how FF1's magic system was changed from stock-based to MP-based, but it doesn't terribly offend me, I guess. This was when I started rolling my eyes over new bonus dungeons and other nonsense added to RPG re-releases. I don't know, that stuff just almost always stands out as feeling tacked on to me, and usually feels like a request from marketing than an idea from the original designers. Maybe I'm just being an old man though, because I'm also not a fan of the Final Fantasy Pixel remasters, but you know what? People really do seem to love these versions, especially on PC where they can be modded, so I don't think this is the right time or place for me to rail against them and spoil your fun. They are the most accessible versions of these games sold today, after all, for better or worse, although the physical compilation is sadly not so accessible, particularly the North American physical. The last FF compilation I want to mention is the Asian release of Final Fantasy VII and VIII for, of all things, the Switch. And only the Switch. Like many Asia region Switch physicals, this combo cart plays in English if your Switch is set to English. It's a neat way to own the HD versions of these games, even if I personally think the original 240p presentation is a bit more cohesive than sharp characters against blurred backgrounds. I don't totally love the quality of the upscales or the font choices, but I do think these are generally better looking than Final Fantasy IX HD and the Chrono Cross Radical Dreamers edition, which, you know, I guess that counts as a compilation because it includes the Satellaview Radical Dreamers game, and the Asia Physical is the only way to own an official physical copy of that, and in English no less. Too bad it's just about the worst SNES upscale I've ever seen though, but I'm happy enough to own it in this way and play it another way. 
the Super Famicom has some rather delightful versions of Dragon Quest 1 and 2 on a single cartridge with a presentation about on par with Dragon Quest 5. Random fun fact, this is one of the extremely few SNES games that I've observed drawing graphics on more than 224 lines. 239 lines to be exact. While I've only played all the way through the NES versions myself, I'd have to say that the Super Famicom has the most pleasing audiovisual presentation of any remake of either game, and fan translations are indeed available. Dragon Quest 1 and 2 Super Famicom was resold on the Wii only in Japan as part of the Dragon Quest 25th anniversary celebration. This package also includes the Dragon Quest VI styled remake of Dragon Quest III alongside the Famicom versions of 1, 2, and 3. And yes, that means it's the weird version of 1 where the hero only faces forward. These games were not available on Virtual Console, which is a shame as this disc lacks 240p support. But the collection does have a suitable amount of celebratory flair otherwise, opening up with a slick pre-title FMV, and it has a snappy museum interface with a decent assortment of nicely digitized boxes and paper materials to peruse. So if it weren't for the game resolution issue and the language barrier, of course, this would be a top flight collection. Anything is better than the Switch versions of Dragon Quest 1, 2, and 3 though, which are based on the Android and iOS versions and look and perform like the absolute junkiest things you can imagine. They could have redone the games with stick figures or ASCII graphics and it would have had a better sense of art and style than this. I got the Asia region physical compilation of these just as a lover and collector of the Dragon Quest series, but even my low expectations were... subseded? Yeah, that seems to be the word. At a glance, Dragon Quest III's presentation seems a tiny bit better, if only because it's so zoomed out you don't see the sprites as closely, but on closer examination it might be even jankier than 1 and 2. Battle scenes in these look passable enough with high res Akira Toriyama monsters, but there really aren't any redeeming qualities to these other than the quality of the underlying game design. These sully the good name of Dragon Quest, and you should play these classics pretty much any other way you possibly can. Sorry, Corey, but I've got to talk about Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Trilogy, The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, and Apollo Justice Ace Attorney Trilogy before I hand it back to you. If you're behind on the series, don't worry, I'm not going to show too much so as to not spoil anything. Of these, it's only the Phoenix Trilogy that lacks a North American physical release, but all physicals of these collections from all regions seem to include English. I'd pre-ordered the Japanese Apollo Trilogy before I knew it was going to have an American physical, and while I regretted not supporting physical Ace Attorney releases outside Japan, the 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6 numbering on the cases and spines is really satisfying, I think. For games 1, 2, 3, and 4, some people seem to not love the high-res renditions of the characters and backgrounds, but they look pretty close to the stylings of the key art, I think, and the original poses are replicated faithfully. The HD reworking of 5, 6, and the Great Ace Attorney games, which were originally polygonal 3DS games, is super impressive to me, though. The animations and expressions translate to higher resolutions shockingly well, to the point that even if I didn't know that they were originally designed for 3DS, I'd still think they look great as Switch games. It was such a treat to finally get English versions of the Great Ace Attorney prequel duology, but I think it's the Apollo Justice 456 trilogy that really shines as a special package, thanks largely due to one of the coolest museum sections I've ever seen. Not only does it have the full soundtracks of 4, 5, and 6 in its music player, it also includes a few live orchestral tracks from across series history, which have been on CDs but have never previously been accessible through the games. The art library is extremely comprehensive too, but most special of all is the animation studio, which lets you put any character from any of the three games against any background and play any animation or voice clip. Objection! Even green screen and other chroma key backgrounds are available. This is a real special gift to fans, I feel, 
and we've already taken advantage of it for creating some fun alerts that the chat can redeem during the backloggery streams. Another sign that this is really made for the fans is that any episode, any chapter can be started up without any prior progress in this version. Capcom treating this latest Ace Attorney compilation with such care makes me even hungrier for an English version of Ace Attorney Investigations 2, and hopefully someday an all new mainline entry in the series. Even though they weren't the first company to release a compilation of their classic games on newer systems, I'd argue that Namco was the first to fully treat their history with the reverence it deserves. Namco Museum is one of, if not the longest running series of game compilations ever conceived, spanning over 25 games in the last 30 years. Namco Museum launched on the original PlayStation with five volumes, each adorned with a different letter on the cover to spell out Namco. Each disc contained between five to seven classics, which are either emulated or rebuilt from the ground up and presented in their 240p glory. Some of these games are fully expected, such as Ms. Pac-Man, Galaga, and Xevious. But others are more surprising, like Ordine and Legend of the Valkyrie, and some of which never appeared again in one of these compilations. In many instances, this was the first time these games were available at home in a virtually arcade-perfect rendition. Where these discs really shine compared to the types of releases that came before and most that have come since is that each disc has an interactive museum that you can move around in in a first-person view and interact with different pieces of each game's history. Whether it's a flyer scan or photos of the arcade PCB, you have context for the game and its nuances. And when you're ready, you can play each one with a variety of modifiers or dip switch settings. Japan got a sixth Encore volume, but since all letters of the name Namco were already taken for the cover, this one cleverly uses the registered trademark symbol instead. It also has one of my personal favorites on it, Rolling Thunder. Unfortunately, much of the museum aspect was set aside as the series matured. Most editions of Namco Museum recycled the same base list of games, but would occasionally spice things up with extra games, like the arranged Pac-Man, Galaga, and Dig Dug in the 2001 PS2, Xbox, and GameCube versions. 2008's Namco Museum Virtual Arcade on the Xbox 360 got a much needed shot in the arm thanks to the inclusion of several Xbox Live arcade games. Galaga Legions, which looks like total nonsense, Mr. Driller Online, which thankfully has a single player component seeing as nobody is playing this online anymore, but most importantly, it has the first Pac-Man Championship Edition there, which is my favorite version of the game. The Evercade Namco Museum duology is a nice grab bag of new and old games, but due to a licensing issue, they're only playable on the Evercade handhelds, which is pretty disappointing. On the Nintendo Switch, Namco Museum Arcade Pack changed things up with a more varied list of games. Splatterhouse is a greatly appreciated addition, while this was also the first time I ever played the arcade version of Rolling Thunder 2. I always thought it was on the Sega Genesis only for the longest time. Most recently, the Namco Museum's Archives, or if you prefer the Japanese name, Namcot Collection, on the Switch is a good collection of Famicom games, which is notable for being the first official localization of the super deformed Splatterhouse Wanpaku Graffiti. But seeing as though this was a M2 developed set, there had to be something extra in there for the fans. This time, they built a NES slash Famicom version of Pac-Man Championship Edition, and it is awesome. <laughs> Additional sets of games are available as DLC, but if you want that version of Pac-Man CE physically, you can get the initial batch of games on cart from Japan. Of course, Namco has done plenty of multi-game releases outside of the museum banner, but they've been surprisingly less prolific in that area. 
Of them, one of the most interesting is the Namco 50th Anniversary Nam Collection on the PlayStation 2, and is, unfortunately, Japanese exclusive. This disc features five iconic PS1 games on one DVD, Ridge Racer, Klonoa, Tekken, Ace Combat 2, and Mr. Driller, all of which have received subtle enhancements like improved frame rate and less texture warping thanks to the additional horsepower of the PlayStation 2. The only real downside is that they're all in Japanese, but honestly, that's a relatively minor hindrance in this batch of games specifically. Also on the PlayStation 2 in Japan is the Gunvari Collection, which bundles enhanced version of Time Crisis 1 in all three Point Blank games, or as it's known in Japan, Gun Bullet. Although the language barrier may be more severe for the extra modes in Point Blank, using a Gun Con 2 may just make it all worth it. Rounding out the Namco lineup is the Namco Shooting Collection for the PlayStation 3, which has Time Crisis Raising Storm, Dead Storm Pirates, and Time Crisis 4 Arcade Edition on one Blu-ray disc. All three games are PlayStation Move compatible, which is a heck of a lot easier to set up and use than the Gun Con 3, even though it looks nowhere near as cool. Shoot them with your golden guns! So Try talked about a couple of the multi-game collections from Capcom and Konami earlier, but that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the breadth of releases over the years, especially in the last decade, with the backing of developers like M2, both companies have really begun to step things up and embrace their heritage. Almost certainly inspired by the Namco Museum collections, both Konami and Capcom ran with various compilations of their own classics spread across multiple volumes. The Capcom Generation series spanned five entries on both the Saturn and PlayStation, each covering a series or theme. The first collection focused on their pioneering vertical shooter series in 1942, with following volumes pulling from the Ghosts and Goblins series, Commando series, classic arcade titles, and of course, Street Fighter. Each disc has a number of supplements like artwork and music arrangements, some of which are extremely well done. Even though most of these are derived from their arcade versions of each game, the Ghosts and Goblins collection includes a port of Super Ghouls and Ghosts for the Super Famicom. Because the Saturn had no 256 pixel wide resolution support, that version in particular will be extremely skinny on that system. The lack of supported resolutions also has a detrimental effect on Mercs in Volume 4, where the Saturn version shimmers like crazy, but the PlayStation version is totally fine. Konami collected their older works on disc with the Antiques series. You won't find a single Contra or Castlevania in sight with the Konami 80s arcade gallery disc, but that doesn't mean that it sucks or anything. Gyrus, Rock and Rope, and Yaya Kung Fu are all influential games that probably don't get enough respect these days, even if they're presented with very few frills and extras in this collection. The trio of Konami MSX collections were an unexpected surprise. I had no idea until fairly recently that these even existed. And this is a perfect way to check out many of their MSX games with a little fuss. The various ports of Gradius are fascinating, and will likely make you appreciate the NES version even more. But I probably spent the most time with the Antarctic Adventure and Penguin Adventure games. Unfortunately, there's no Space Manbo in this collection. These discs were later compiled onto one for the Saturn, called the MSX Ultra Pack. With the mention of Gradius, it became clear to me during the production of this episode that that entire series might just be their most often compiled and re-released series, starting with Gradius and the Salamander Deluxe packs on the PS1 and Saturn, select games in the series have been repackaged together numerous times over the years. Gradius 3 and 4 on the PlayStation 2 is the perfect companion piece to the previously mentioned Deluxe pack. The third game even runs at its native 240p, while the fourth game runs at 480i, as I assume the arcade version does. I only mention this because the collection came out early enough that it didn't get swept up in the 
oh, let's force 480i mode on all 240p games in a collection because it's a higher resolution and therefore it automatically has got to look better, right? That mentality tainted a ton of retro collections over the following decade. 2006's Gradius collection for the PlayStation Portable takes those two and adds in Gradius 1, Gradius 2 Go For No Yabo, and the PlayStation 1 exclusive Gradius Gaiden for an extremely impressive lineup of shooters. You know, I'd never actually even played Gradius Gaiden before this collection, and I immediately went out and bought myself a PS1 copy because it was that good. Hey, don't worry. I am not forgetting about the various Konami anniversary collections that have come out in recent years, but I'm going to hold those back for a future video. So, while Nintendo was busy re-releasing their NES games piecemeal on the Game Boy Advance, Capcom gave us the Capcom Mini Mix, which pushed three NES games, Strider, Mighty Final Fight, and Bionic Commando onto a single GBA cart. And, you know what? It's surprisingly well executed. Well, except for Strider, which was fairly broken programming-wise at a base level. I'm pretty sure that this port to the GBA further compounded those inherent issues, because now there's audio slowdown too. Capcom really went all in on downloadable games during the PS360 years, and released a ton of sequels and remakes to their classic games during this period. I mean, who can forget about Commando 3 with its terrible art style and bog standard twin stick shooter gameplay? Or what about Street Fighter 2 HD Remix? I feel like everyone was super excited for this when it was first revealed, and I was too. But revisiting it now, wow, the entire look of this has aged terribly. Or I don't know, maybe it was never good. Regardless, I think that it looks pretty silly now. What about uh, Bionic Commando Rearm 2, the original sequel to the excellent remake of the NES game that commits the ultimate sin, adding a jump button. But you know, I gotta hand it to them for having the guts to make Brad Spencer look like a high school gym teacher. The only way to get most of these games physically is via the Capcom Digital Collection disc for the Xbox 360. This disc is surprisingly not too expensive either, if you want to grab yourself a copy now. My only wish is that it included the original Bionic Commando Rearmed. Capcom Puzzle World on the PlayStation Portable has a few games that are perfectly appropriate for a handheld, like Super Puzzle Fighter 2 and a number of the Buster Brothers games. But if those games are your jam, you'd be much better served to get the Buster Brothers collection on the PlayStation 1. The third entry Buster Buddy. is a legit awesome game and has been my warm blanket throughout the making of this entire episode. The Dungeons and Dragons collection on the Saturn was one of the all-time must-haves on the system. The two-game collection has excellently ported versions of two D&D arcade games, Shadow Over Mistara and Tower of Doom. Both games were released as the Chronicles of Mistara collection on the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC, and that version is fine. But if you're looking for something a bit more uh, physical, there was a disc release in Japan. But the thing is, it's a completely different version than the downloadable one. That version of the game was handled internally by Capcom, and by the original team even, and is much better in many respects. Except that it's... Uh, completely in Japanese, even the menus. So the language barrier is thick, but still, this is a fascinating thing to even exist. It's just too bad that this version wasn't the one that was localized. But who knows, uh, maybe it will show up on something else in the future. All right, I totally get that I am leaving out loads of stuff and I'm skipping over some essential collections, like the various Mega Man Legacy collections that have come out pretty consistently over the last several years, or the different Street Fighter collections. But you know what? Those are better served as a focus for an entire segment in a future episode.
Well, hopefully that was a satisfying enough selection of collections for one episode. We made a massive list of compilations, and even just based on what we own ourselves, this only scratched the surface. And it's been fun, so if y'all liked it, we'd like to do this subject again. Are there any compilations that you really like that do something unique, or any that got a physical release only in regions outside North America? We'd love to know, and it might just be something that we can cover next time. <laughs> <laughs>